Hi everyone and welcome to Real Life Talks. I'm your host Yvonne Heath, author of the book Love Your Life to Death and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. <laughs> so I am so excited to have my wonderful friend Cindy Watson with me today. Hello Cindy. Hi there, it is so great to be here. I'm thrilled. Thanks for the invite. I don't even know where to start but uh, <laughs> I'll start with the fact that we met many years ago when yeah. I started writing my book. Yeah. I joined the Muskoka Authors Association yeah. and you and Wendy Donaby running the show. Yeah, I was uh, so thrilled to be part of your journey and watch you explode onto the scene. It's been great. So. Well, yes, and at the time, so you, at the time, you were you're very passionate about helping other authors, which was so nice, and and, okay. and it was just such a, such a wonderful place to go and to gather, to support each other and to learn. Yeah. And you were an author at the time, and you had written the book. <laughs> I'm gonna well, say, thank yes, you. Yes, here it is. <laughs> Out of the Darkness, the Jeff Healy story. Yeah. And it is a wonderful story. I learned so much Thank about you. the incredible musician who lost his vision as a child, yeah. right? And and you shared a story. And tomorrow is the anniversary, anniversary of his, his death. death because today is March first yeah. on our recording day, and so it was March second. Yeah, March second. And amazing. It's eleven years now. It's hard to wow. believe it's over a decade already. So. Yes. Yeah, and it was a fluke how I came to that story because I'd done some writing, obviously, and. My husband grew up with Jeff Healy. They were very oh, close friends, wow. but I'd only met him the once and I didn't realize he was sick at the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought at the time, oh, it'd be interesting to do an article about him. And then he died not long after that. And the more I started hearing about him and looking into him, I just thought what an incredibly inspirational story oh. about living your life with passion and squeezing Absolutely. every ounce of juice out. and overcoming adversity and not ever using it as an excuse. It was a great story. Well, and he certainly so. did because of course, being a blind musician, singer, you could have had all kinds of excuses to yeah. say, oh, I can't, I Absolutely. can't see. And he certainly did not yeah. do that. And I mean, his yeah. legacy lives on forever. Absolutely, yes. and refused to even use his blindness when he had all kinds of promotional opportunities where they wanted to sort of capitalize on mm -hmm. his blindness. He wanted to be recognized for the value of his music. Extraordinary. And not, yeah, he was an extraordinary man. Yes, yeah, he truly, yes, he truly was. And speaking of extraordinary <laughs> and watching people's journeys explode. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go back and I love that I asked you the question about a little bit about your past because we know each other, but yeah. I did not know this piece. And you were saying, of course, I knew you were social justice lawyer yes. for over 30 years, yeah. but I did not know that you grew up. Tell us a little bit about yeah, your, it, well, yes. Yeah, it's interesting. I grew up in a sort of a tough neighborhood mm -hmm. in a low rental apartment, although of course you don't recognize that it's a low rental or a tough neighborhood at the time. It's just home. Sure. And you know, it's not until I hit, uh, and predominantly working class, but it was, you know, there were allegations of gangs around the area. And wow. It was, uh, and then when I went off to middle school in grade seven and eight, all of a sudden a lot of the kids that I were meeting who were from the other side of the creek, uh, yes. <laughs> not the other side of the tracks, it was the other right. side of the creek, and uh, much more affluent area and that I hadn't been exposed to, and they weren't allowed to come home whenever I invited wow. them. And at first I, I didn't quite get it, but mm -hmm. to be honest, Yvonne, it was the look on my dad's face that I knew, I just knew looking at him, and I saw his fear that we were being held back by where we came from. And it was, uh, I think, a real pivotal moment for me because I just became really driven to succeed and to make him proud and, you know, I guess at some level to prove the world wrong, you know, right. that I had value. So I, you know, I was driven to go right from high school to university to law school looking for those straight A's just to follow that expected path, although that has mm. its perils as well, right? It certainly does. So. And and just going back, it, it, I'm glad in, it did propel you and, and to be successful and you were very successful in your um, career as a lawyer, but to feel like we have something to prove because this is where we're yeah. from, right? Isn't It yeah. is sad though, isn't it? it because is. I say over and over, why do we each have value? Yeah. Because we exist. Yeah, absolutely. Regardless. And doubly so as women, I find. And the yes. more I'm working now, especially since founding Women on Purpose, I mean, I think class, um, certainly culture, can. They're, they're all different things that can either hold us back or propel us to, to sort of drive forward. Mm -hmm. But especially as women, I find we just carry so much baggage and generation after generation of conditioning that stops us from being our like most fabulous selves and stepping into our power and and trusting in our sort of natural and intuitive power absolutely yeah. but here's the thing you know being a woman in a man's world sometimes they say yeah who are we the word uh, who is the hardest on us first of all ourselves Selves. 
and other women. Yeah. That's we oh. right. Uh, we 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 blame the man, and it's yeah. a man's world. But women do not. Yeah. It seems like we've forgotten our nature to yeah. nurture each other. It is such a pet peeve of mine. And it's funny because yes. that's a lot of the work that I'm doing now, which mm -hmm. I didn't anticipate when I started down this road. And you're seeing a lot of finger pointing and for women sort of looking to blame that we're being, we've been exploited or we've been oppressed. And, and I'm worried because we're seeing a real polarization of the sexes right now. So a lot mm -hmm. of the work I'm doing is actually on trying to bridge the gender gap as well, because there are so many unconscious biases on both sides. Yes. But women are, for me, the first work has to be done internally. Like we're, we're still coming from this scarcity mindset. And I, I get it. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that long ago, frankly, that women didn't have the right to vote or right. hold property. Or yes. We weren't even recognized as persons in the eyes of the law. So. I mean, That's this possible. sense of having, you know, this this possibility of power and, and meaning is relatively new. So I get that that's going to take some time. But frankly, if we don't start believing in ourselves and mm -hmm. raising our awareness to push past those limiting beliefs, but mostly getting out of that scarcity mindset so that we support... The potential, when we support each other and lift each other yes. up, that's why I love doing retreats. You get a group of women together in that environment where they don't feel any of that need to compete or that right. pressure or that, and I hate to say, you almost have to remove that male attention. Mm -hmm. It is a completely different dynamic and right. it is so powerful to watch that happen. So. so yeah, so let's go back. So you founded a movement called Women on Purpose yes. and and you are, what is the what is the goal, purpose, mission? Yeah, and it's interesting because I think just how I came there is as you say, I had, you know, a 30 year practice as a social justice lawyer and in particular doing a lot of labor, labor work with mm -hmm. trade unions. So, mm -hmm. you know, the industry was already at that time getting a little less so, but still got a lot of work to do. But a totally male dominated industry is law. Yeah. And within the labor market on the trade union side in particular, I was routinely the only woman in the room when wow. I started. Right. I mean, mm. including my clients, the adjudicator, the other side, you name it, everybody. Really? And um, but having said, and I loved what I did. I felt very passionately. I did a lot of women's advocacy, a lot of human rights work as well, mm -hmm. um, and focused on that. But all of a sudden, I reached a middle age point, and I felt this emptiness, like this hole, like some, something was missing. I felt this dissatisfaction. And then, of mm -hmm. course, being women, I felt guilty that I felt this dissatisfaction. But the more I became vocal about it and trusted enough to speak about it, I realized this was a really universal problem. So mm -hmm. the original impetus was that the more I looked into it, I firmly believe women tend, I, I think both men and women, frankly, to be fair, but okay. women in particular are much more likely to follow an expected path in life, to follow that traditional path mm -hmm. and end up not pursuing their true passion from, right. from a young age. Mm -hmm. And there's a price for that. Like I believe we all have unique gifts and at least one really unique gift that if we trusted and were taught to trust when we were young, mm -hmm. if it's something you love and you're passionate about and you're good at, that's what you should be pursuing in life. But we're, we're so conditioned to do the opposite, follow that traditional, you know, law was a traditional success path to money. And I know for my parents, I loved to sing and dance as a kid. I, mm -hmm. you know, I would have loved, I loved writing as a kid. Yes. It was, these were things I was passionate about and sort of stifled that to do the expected. So Women on Purpose originally the impetus was and still is, the umbrella if you will, is to really help women rediscover their unique gift mm -hmm. and rekindle that passion that they felt and have a life on purpose and with purpose, hence right. the Women on Purpose. Love it. So, but more I started working with women, I really started to quickly realize that the thing I think that was holding them back the most was this fear of negotiation. Oh, yes. And so I've, I've started this Art of Feminine Negotiation program, and I've got a book that, knock on wood, if all goes well, will be coming out later this yes. year. Yes. called The Art of Feminine Negotiation, How to Get What You Want from the Boardroom to the Bedroom. Ooh, yes, ooh, thank yes, you. That's right. <laughs> I want what I want, when I want it. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. And if only you were passionate, though, Cindy. I mean, you know. <laughs> I know. Anyways, I know. It's yeah. getting me excited. It's yes, I will. Fun. And... <laughs> but isn't it wonderful, right, yeah. to to have a, a topic that Absolutely. you feel just fueled by? Yeah. And it's interesting because you just knew you were there was something gnawing at yeah. you. You were dissatisfied, and you thought maybe it was going to look like this. Yeah. But then, as you start to have conversations yeah. and speak to more people, you realize yeah. women are afraid of negotiating. And I will just full disclosure here: I'm not great at it. Yeah. I just say, Jordy. 
I'm like unicorns and butterflies, yeah. and can you please go <laughs> negotiate my speaking fee and yeah. whatever? Because it's not our comfort zone. And it's, I mean, many women are nurturers, and I was a nurse and a mom, so certainly yeah. I don't negotiate. Yeah. And of course, as you've also shared, men will tend to negotiate and get a much higher fee. Yes. And yes. women still today, What's which the is remarkable. Deal? We need to stop. Well, that. you just hit the nail on the mm -hmm. head, though, when you said I can't negotiate very well, because that is one of the biggest myths. Mm -hmm. And part of my job is to try and break, debunk that myth. Let's I, I think there's two. I think most women women tend to go, and obviously this is a generalization, but yes, I, I think course. tend to go one of two ways when it comes to negotiation. Women either feel like they're not, as you just said, ironically, it's my total target yeah. right, right? I'm not a good negotiator. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of women, I think, fall into that category where they truly believe at their core that they're not effective as a negotiator, which of course holds them back from sure. being, stepping into their power as a negotiator. Or, and I'll come back to that in a sec, but the other extreme, and I was guilty of this. Watch your mic there. Oh, Ms. sorry. I'll thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, is, overcompensation where you have okay. those women who feel that the only way to succeed is to bring what I will call that masculine energy mm. into the negotiation and overcompensate. Oh, interesting. And and the irony is that if we just trusted in our feminine strengths, I believe, and this may be controversial, so I'll apologize in advance, but I think that when women tap into their natural strength as negotiators, they are naturally better negotiators than men. And, we don't know this. And here's the key, because if you look at the key markers that make up a good negotiator, so you've got, and I'll leave assertiveness to the end, but rapport building, empathy, trustworthiness, um, intuition, flexibility, all of these are the key markers of a good negotiator. So I wouldn't have... I, I wouldn't have thought Absolutely. that. Okay, is that so interesting? And are they not all traditionally considered feminine traits? I have all these those. are things we do every day mm -hmm. in a million ways without even realizing it. Whether we're brokering between the kids, frankly, or always trying to be the peacemakers. We they call it women's intuition for a reason. Women sure. are infinitely more flexible. I mean, it all of the key markers that you need, and and not only that we need but that we're already using in so many ways, but we don't think of it as negotiation. But here, I think that I just had a little aha moment in our head, because, or in my head, because is it because we don't feel we have that value as whatever we're negotiating? Because yeah. yeah, we negotiate all the yeah. time. Yeah, but to I claim think our value. I, I think one, that's the key one. Mm -hmm. And one is this, again, generations of conditioning of women not stepping into and owning their value is a problem. I think we have some baggage as well where women have a lot of work to do still on this worry about somehow emasculating men, right? right that, okay. And we tend to hold ourselves back in those situations and not actually step into our natural power. Uh, but I think a big part of it as well is for a lot of women, it's that not feeling enough, mm -hmm. but also just feeling that they're that negotiation is all about what I call the bark and the bite. I think, and that's the second myth that ties directly into it. That people mistakenly assume that negotiation means you need to be. Most people think aggressive, sure. and they conflate assertiveness with aggressiveness. Mm. Neither are true, frankly, because. Assertiveness definitely is one of those six key factors to, that make up a good negotiator, mm -hmm. but it's only one of six factors. So and frankly, assertiveness without the empathy, intuition, rapport building, trust, and flexibility is going to be a very ineffective tool on its own. Wow. But the other key that I find so interesting is that even, so of those six, five out of six, clearly I think women are naturally mm -hmm. excel at. Mm -hmm. But even on assertiveness, women assume that they're not as assertive and therefore they can't be effective negotiators. Right. And A, that's not true because not all negotiations about assertiveness, but when you're negotiating for your kids or advocating for oh, your kids yeah. or an aging parent or when you were a nurse, I bet you were the strong, I mean, you're such a compassionate person, mm -hmm. I can see you there. When you're advocating for others, we are so powerful mm -hmm. and yet, so it's clearly not a capability issue. So interesting. So the tip mm -hmm. I'll often give to women is you can invoke your mama bear for your kids or for other people you care about. Remember that little mama bear, that little baby cub you have inside yourself? Because yeah. we all have that little bear sure. cub still, that of little course. girl, that little insecure girl or little mm -hmm. insecure boy. So mm -hmm. invoke your mama bear for your own bear cub. That is, honestly, I in, in thinking of negotiation or any of that, I've never heard all of this and it's it is it's like incredibly interesting that 
all, yeah, we have most yeah. of the qualities and we don't even think twice and we certainly yeah. don't think twice about uh, advocating or for and negotiating for anyone else. Wow, so we don't oh yeah. my goodness. And it's funny because most negotiation courses out there, they all focus on tactics and to me that's way late in the process and way less important to be honest because mm -hmm. And the one thing I loved about coming into this art of feminine negotiation is I'd been resisting anything to do with my law career. Because you can imagine, yes. I felt very conflicted. Like mm -hmm. all of the positive reinforcement I got as a lawyer was when I was ripping people apart. So I was guilty of all, I fully admit, confess, you know, my name is Cindy Watson and I was too aggressive, right? And there I fell go. into that trap and everybody, and meant it as a compliment, called me Barracuda or Piranha. Mm -hmm. and you, and, I, and then I thought back to a negotiation course I'd taken in law school where we were basically bargaining for our marks. We had to take this simulated course. And I recognized only in hindsight that I won almost every one of those simulated negotiations. But back then, I was operating from my natural place. It was all about, okay, we've only got an hour to negotiate this simulation. What do you need? What do you want? Right. Building trust, building rapport, finding out, you know, trying to use my intuition, all of those feminine traits. And somewhere along the line, I lost that in the process, right? Mm -hmm. so. Wow, it's so interesting. And, and when we leave our careers and we think, oh, you know, I need to start yeah. something new. But the truth is, when you have that foundation of 30 years, it, it, to yeah. draw on your experience oh, so nice and to, to use it. it is, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I've done the same yeah. thing, thinking that Absolutely. I am leaving this career. Yeah. But yeah, to to use what you've learned Absolutely. and to say, yeah, maybe I would have done this differently, yeah. but it brought you to this place yeah. of creating change yeah. and empowering women along yeah. the way. And I just want to make sure I don't forget because the women on purpose. So where can People, I know find you have me. a, yes, where can yeah. people find you just because I don't want to forget that's yeah, so Yeah, no, thanks for that, one. I appreciate it. Um, and I, I'd say a couple of places. One, I've got a website, obviously, yes. womenonpurpose.ca. Okay. Not .com, .ca. Dot .ca, yes. But also I'd invite any of your listeners to check out the Facebook page. Sure. So it's facebook.com slash womenonpurposecommunity. Okay. But also feel free to email me at cindy at womenonpurpose.ca because I have a free ebook. Oh, yes. Uh, called Wonderful. the Women on Purpose Blueprint. So mm -hmm. anybody who's interested, just email. I'm happy to send the link and you can download it's got lots of useful stuff and it's oh great. that's so wonderful so, that's yeah. so wonderful and i am really looking i want i want a signed copy can i already order it of, um, <laughs> when it comes out because I, I have to read it again the art of negotiation how to get what they want from the boardroom to the bedroom yes. thank you very much that's, <laughs> yes. why shouldn't we i love it yeah. so i just i have to talk about the fact that so you had this law career for many years lawyer and in the la in the last i don't know how long the last yeah. year or so you have been on the adventure of a lifetime yeah. <laughs> i'm looking on facebook and i'm like she's sure. what is this cindy's bobsledding so um so we'll get to that talk about i mean you just you have explored yeah. It's like you've explored the yeah. world, but you're looking for your your direction and meeting people. Yeah. And tell us about your incredible adventure. Yeah. It's been amazing to watch. Well, thanks. And I think it's a combination of things. I think one is rediscovering, you know, practicing what I preach. If mm -hmm. I'm out there talking to women about rekindling that passion and that purpose, like when I was younger, I loved to travel and I loved adventure and I was, you know, not afraid to push past my fear to take risks in things and. Um, so it was beautiful for me and I find as women a, a lot and again this isn't universal but I think a lot of women as soon as we become mothers mm -hmm. there's this mind shift this mindset switch that goes off and suddenly because I had I remember before I met my husband we started late made up for lost time got married and had three kids in three years wow. but before that I again I'd gone bungee jumping skydiving scuba diving with sharks and I didn't realize it at the time, but I think I was sort of testing the, the sort of boundaries of my feminine power, for want mm -hmm. of a better term. But then I had the kids, and to be honest, I want all of that stuff. And it wasn't no. conscious, totally not conscious. But we do that. Yeah. We forget I had opportunities ourselves. to go scuba diving, and I'd go, you go to my husband, uh, and I'd sit back and look after the do kids that, on the ladies. beach. Yeah, go do scuba not. diving. Absolutely. Right? Like, why do we do yeah. that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, we so do. much of our identity gets wrapped up in being a mother. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it goes back to that whole Madonna whore thing. And it's so deeply ingrained that yes. we become this different version of ourselves. Absolutely. Like, it drives me crazy. Women at baby showers or whatever. Like, 
we had brains. We used to have intelligent conversations. What happens that suddenly we get together and all we can talk about are the kids yeah. and childbirth and it should be a you know, part. Of course, this is a wonderful a new journey, but part. let's Absolutely. also go scuba diving. Yeah, don't lose yourself. So yes. I'm rediscovering important. that yep. again. So I went skydiving again. Yes. I don't know if you saw that online. And just last week, only a few days ago, actually, I went bobsledding on like a professional Olympic course at you know 127 kilometers an hour. Yes. <laughs> where was that? Uh, Whistler, where because. From back from the Vancouver Olympics, they still have the Olympic yes. bobsled. Uh, I, like I just, I have to take my moment here for a minute. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm gonna have Cindy on the show, and I'm looking through Facebook. I'm like, Cindy's bobsledding yeah. somewhere. Oh my, oh my gosh! No, and to be fair, I didn't pilot it. They had a professional pilot at the front, but oh, you didn't was, pilot it. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> You could not get me into a bobsled, so that is extraordinary. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. no, I really, I won't even go on a roller coaster. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, we're very maybe different. You yeah, enjoy no. It. Okay. Um, so, how was it? Was it exhilarating? I loved it. It was exciting. I love speed. So, but I, I will say there was a moment because they gave the big hype before the bobsled as well about you know apparently somebody had broke their back a few years oh, ago wow. and there is you know a risk. This is a real deal, mm -hmm. and you're going to be hitting G force. There's only only fighter jets and space shuttles and bobsled apparently where you can get it and if you have any back or neck problems don't do it oh my and I'm gosh. so cocky at the beginning because the speed we get right out of the gate they push us and I'm like woohoo you know and I thought this is a piece of cake what are they talking about yeah and all of a sudden we hit that point part way through when my I just felt like the g-force is quite a remarkable pressure and your head starts going and you can barely control it from oh hitting the sides goodness. of the bobsled but the biggest surprise was up the back there was this tremendous pressure all the way up my spine <laughs> that I will say that little piece was not yeah, the most comfortable. Like yeah. I felt it, mm -hmm. but I was thrilled to have done it. And then you, as soon as you come, the whole thing lasts like 40 seconds or whatever, wow. right? So it's, it's oh my a quick adrenaline rush, but it was uh, fun. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so you've done, gone skydiving, <laughs> bobsledding, but you've also, you've traveled, you've been yeah. to different places. Where yeah. have you gone? And a lot of that is programming that I've been taking as well. Right? Yes. Because starting this new venture, like so much of it now is online and through social media, and that's something I hadn't really participated in much. So, yes. But yeah, I've been to Abu Dhabi and Hawaii and... Oh my gosh, you know, I seem to be crack California a lot. They they are much more, they're ahead of us on a lot of these things, I think, in California, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing, getting a lot of sort of programming there as well. And obviously taking some time while I'm in these places to explore the local culture and, and practice what I preach and yes. be living life. And as I said in the Jeff Healy books, you know, out of darkness, squeeze every little bit of juice every little bit. that we and, can every day. Yeah. And you met incredible people, like yes. leaders, and you yeah. spent some time with Jack Canfield. Yes, that was super exciting. And yes. he was very excited about uh, the art of feminine negotiation. Yeah. Super encouraging about it. He's like, I don't know anybody who's doing this. I think this is such an important mission, which I feel very mission driven about it. So that was great. Yes. Yeah. Well, and you had an interview with him and can yeah. people find that on your Facebook yes, page? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's on my Facebook page and I it's also it. on my webpage. So thanks well, for that. Yeah, no, that's incredible. Lovely. Yes. Well, uh, I, I hope to be able to say that myself someday, but, yeah. but to what you've done is you said, okay, I have um, a new passion. I have a new purpose. I need to go out there and find leaders and mentors Absolutely. and and that's the thing also right like and I did the same thing let's go out there and talk to people and Absolutely. hear what is missing and hear yeah. what what do the people need and yeah. and and how can I be yeah. my best self and I'd love and I think it's at both sides like for me I wanted to be the best possible version of myself and to mm -hmm. really be doing and it's an ongoing process I don't think that ever ends like no. doing that inner work to get pushed past all those limiting beliefs and that conditioning and challenge yourself every day to be the best version of yourself. And I think one of the things we need to get over now is getting coaching. Like I, yes. all of the best coaches in the world have coaches and for sports, we're always conditioned to accept. Nobody would expect Wayne Gretzky to be where he is yes. or Tiger Woods or frankly, any of the, the, the top football stars or yes. basketball. They. It's acceptable, and yet on the most important aspect of our life, like sports in the scheme of things, no disrespect to professional athletes, but it's it's a, such a small part compared to how we present to the world and what sure. we give to the world. And the same for you with your fabulous work that you do on grief. People who need coaching on that need to recognize that they need to go out and seek the coaching. Absolutely. You know? so. I think that is a really key point also because I, many people, women, I'll speak about women, yeah. just kind of, okay, so 
I don't know what to do. I, I know I want to do something different yeah. and I, I should know what I want. Again, we're so hard on ourselves. Get help. Yeah. <laughs> like, and women don't help. like to spend money on themselves. They see it oh, frivolous. Huge. And that goes back to what you said at the beginning, owning our value. We deserve to be the best version of ourselves. And frankly, I think the thing that we don't recognize, it's more selfish to not take care of it than not because you can only bring your best to your kids. And I, for, especially for women, I often say to them, think of the message you're setting for your daughters and 100%. for your sons. Because if for you example, are if the martyr mm -hmm. and always put your needs as secondary, you're basically telling your daughter that her needs are not gonna be as important as any man she meets in her life. And you're telling your sons that they are entitled to assume that their needs are more important. This is, I, I'm so glad that you shared that because I think, I believe, and yes, it is the most valuable message that we can bring is our teaching by example. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you're right, it's the message to your sons and to your daughters and to any other person who is watching, right? Oh, look, she's a martyr. She puts everyone else first. She doesn't Absolutely. care about her own needs. Isn't she wonderful? Yeah. Say no, actually. Yeah. Say that is very selfish because you are not being your best yeah. self and you're being a poor example. Absolutely. And don't think they don't pick it up. I remember oh, my yes. daughter, like we, as I said, we had three kids in three years. So my, my daughter Jade is the oldest and then had two boys in very quick succession. Mm -hmm. And invariably when we were young, if there were two brownies left on a plate, Jade would go, oh, that's okay. Let the boys have it. I don't want one. And Eat what the was the response? <laughs> yeah, and that's what I did. And my husband and you was like, brownie. oh, Jade, you're so sweet. Oh, and I said, yeah. stop that. We you eat sad. that brownie, so. We yeah. are done with that, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> oh my gosh, can you believe we're already out of time? This We could chat about this. For, <laughs> we're both a little passionate about this. Cindy, I love what you're doing. Thank Women you. on Purpose, Likewise. Cindy Watson, and um, the art of negotiation. We can do this. We have that power within us already. Yes. And I am so excited for your upcoming book and to watch Thank your you. journey unfold. You go ahead and skydive and bobsled. I will watch <laughs> the pictures. You, pictures. you send me pictures, that's good enough. Thank you so okay. much, my friend. Great to be here, thank you. Thanks. So thanks for joining us today. Real Life Talks is about learning how to be empowered and resilient, learning how to just show up for yourself and for others. So if you wanna be empowered and resilient and learn how to negotiate, <laughs> my call to action as always is plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always, bring your own tambourine to the party. <laughs> Thanks, bye for now.